Hello and welcome to Sex Unwrapped, a podcast by Saving Lives UK, with myself, Tom Hayes, a Saving Lives trustee who's been living with HIV for 10 years, and Dr. Naomi Sutton, an NHS consultant and star of Channel 4's Sex Clinic. Sex Unwrapped is a podcast exploring everything sex. Together with our guests, we'll be exploring sex, sexuality, sexual health and sexual pleasure. Basically everything to do with sex. So slip into something more comfortable and let's go. So today we are honoured to have the um, wonderful Becky, who's going to talk to us um, about her journey about HIV. So Becky works as a service user engagement lead and training coordinator for HIV support and prevention services, BHA Lead Skyline. She's been HIV positive since August 2015, which is when I first met her. She's a teacher, trainer, HIV activist, peer supporter and a single mum to one daughter. She's passionate about normalising HIV for all and making sure women are always included in the HIV conversation. And from my point of view, I I mean, you know, Becky and I have known each other since um, you first got diagnosed, but you've always been an inspiration to me about your journey, which is kind of why, you know, I wanted you to be on this podcast, because one, you speak so eloquently about HIV, but also you've you really have transformed your life. Um, So. So hello, Becky. Hi. Hi, Thank welcome. everyone. Thank you for joining us. So Becky, could you kick off with maybe telling us a bit about the, the point of diagnosis, but so kind of what you felt to hate or what you heard about HIV, what you thought of HIV, and then um, I guess the point of diagnosis and how you felt. So kind of, it was a dark time, wasn't it? Yeah, so in terms of my thoughts about HIV before my diagnosis was that I didn't have any thoughts about HIV before diagnosis. HIV hadn't even entered into my world at all. Um, So I would say I didn't, apart from what the very basics that was taught in high school in 2000, (laughs) 2001, when I did sex education in high school, which was just that it was a sexually transmitted infection. That's all I knew about HIV and that people in the past died from it. And that was that was it. Um, and I hadn't, it wasn't on my radar. So when I was told about it, the only thing that I had done was um, Googled the symptoms like just before I got my results from the test and I sort of dismissed them as that, oh, you're being paranoid. That's just flu. It's just, you're just sick. You're not, you don't have HIV. And so I was still shocked when I found out. Um, Yeah, just incredibly, incredibly shocked. And I think that whole disbelief, you know, people don't, I've heard many people say the same things. You just sort of like, no, that's not, this isn't actually happening. I'll get another test done and it'll be negative. You know, it, it was that kind of situation. I remember being told by a health worker I remember being really angry at her. I'm like, who are you telling me this information? Because I had no idea who this person was that I'd sat in a room with. Um, and then, yeah, I just I just cried a lot. Just mm-hmm. cried a lot. And uh, my daughter was with me at the time. She was only two, so she didn't really know what was going on. Um, and I just remember being moved around from room to room. And in Sheffield, the, um, the HIV area was in like a basement. So I literally got took from this lovely room with a lovely big window and a big view down to a dark, dingy basin (laughs) that smelt kind of mouldy. And I was like, oh, so this is where this is where we go, is it? (laughs) You know, Um, and that's yeah, that's sort of what it felt like at the start. I think that's a common experience for a lot of people living with HIV, isn't it? You you're whisked from a, you know, the sexual health link, which you've probably been to several times to a to a brand new building, which until um, recently, a lot of HIV clinics were very underfunded, and they were. Mine was a porter cabin um, <laughs> behind behind the hospital. Where I had my sexual health test. The doctor's office was a bed with a laptop on it, um, oh, wow. and there was that, that was the HIV clinic. So yeah, I think it's a. It, it, it's not the best way to start your HIV journey, isn't it? But yeah. obviously, you met some amazing HIV doctors to to help you along your journey. Yeah, I remember Naomi wasn't the first doctor I saw. Um, on my day of diagnosis it was a different doctor but then I went in the next day without my daughter and that's when I first was uh, paired up with uh, Naomi. <laughs> the magic. Looked back. <laughs> <laughs> 
Becky, can I pick up on, you know, the fact that you said, so you did a, you did a bit of HIV in high school or whatever, but obviously mm-hmm. people who aren't um, watching this on YouTube might just be listening. Um, obviously you're a white female. Um, you're, would you class yourself as heterosexual or how, how do you define your... Well, on my census, I officially put pansexual. Pansexual, okay. Uh, that's my official government status. <laughs> um, but... Um, I'm sure we'll go on to this, but you know, you contracted this from heterosexual sex. I think the um, the problem is is that white, especially white heterosexual people, don't see themselves as a, as as at risk. Mm, yeah, yeah. Which I think it's part of the problem. So we dismiss things that we think aren't going to affect us. I think you know, it's almost like if they're anything like me, it's not even that you don't see yourself as risk. It's just not even part of your world. Yeah. Like, not talked about it's not brought up it was certainly never asked about I don't even remember being asked about it when I was pregnant having the test I mean the test when I was pregnant but I don't even remember being asked about it it was just one of the things that got done and I wasn't told oh your HIV test came back negative during pregnancy it was just logged on my file so it wasn't even registered even then you know it was done but it wasn't discussed with me I don't think and so tell me about the first few months of coming to terms with the diagnosis. What- well, it was a really weird time in my life because I'd only been separated from my husband sort of three months previous to um, to when I had sex with this person. Mm. So I was not only dealing with a toddler, a HIV diagnosis and a divorce because I was with my husband for 10 years. So it was like all of those three things in one go. Um, I made it a lot worse for myself shacking up with this guy who had given me HIV as well. So I just clung on to him kind of as just something there, you know, because I was going through all of this and I just wanted some someone else there to go through it with me. So it was a really dark, depressing time. I lost a lot of weight. Um, I've looked at my weight loss since then. I asked for them back from the clinic and it's massive. So I was about 16 stone before I met this guy and I'd gone down to about 14 stone before I'd got my diagnosis and then I went down to about 10 stone by about October November wow it was a massive weight loss and and I just had diarrhea all the time so I was a teacher secondary school teacher and I had to leave my lessons maybe twice in a one-hour lesson to Mm. the toilet um I couldn't walk up the stairs at school um, I remember the, you had this really big staircase you had to go up for meetings in the morning and I was just like oh I just can't even get up the stairs and then I was signed off work for about seven weeks after that so it was all really the the, the fatigue that came because I had just such extreme seroconversion there was talk about admitting me to hospital for fluids and stuff but I was like no I just refused <laughs> to go I just lived in my bed And I felt very guilty because I used to drop my daughter off at nursery and then go home and just sit in bed all day. Mm. I was very tired and I physically couldn't really do anything. Um, And then all my hair started falling out. That was fun. They said we thought it might be the ARVs I was put on. I was put on Trimec in October after diagnosed in August. But then we stopped the Trimec and put a different tablet and then the hair was still falling out. So it was put down to my lack of nutrition from you know the diarrhea and vomiting and stuff like that so yeah it was all a bit rubbish oh and then I started getting loads of mouth ulcers as well around Christmas that year so it all just was just like one thing after another for a long time yeah that's a lot it must have really ground you down but look at you now oh I'm very healthy now (laughs) healthy (laughs) and all the hair (laughs) yeah I have lots of hair it did grow back thankfully yeah I mean, I have quite thick curly hair anyway, so most people, luckily, wouldn't have ever noticed the difference. But yeah. I can see the difference, you know. I had very long hair and I had to chop it all off because every time I brushed it, it would just get all matted and all this hair would fall out. And So I didn't really think about my diagnosis very much because I was dealing with all of those physical sides of it, if that makes sense. It, it, I didn't really think about what it meant to have HIV, yeah. So what was the turning point for you? What what marks that um, return to uh, better mental health, better physical health? Was there um, something that changed for you? Was there support you accessed? You know, what made that change happen? 
it's a, it's a mixture of things. So I was in this terribly toxic relationship. Um, I remember talking to Naomi about it and she said, she said to me, you know, you don't have to stay with him just because you both have HIV. And I remember saying at the time, oh, no, 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 that's not, that's not why I'm with him. It's not why I'm with him. But now, obviously, looking on reflection, I was like, it totally was. <laughs> it was definitely was because it was easy. It was easier to be with him than to have to think about anything else. So I think my turning point was around November 2016. My daughter kept on getting these reoccurring urine infections and I had to, you know, go in hospital with her and stay overnight with her. And just the period, things of events that happened around that time to do with that partner and myself and my daughter. And it, all, it just kind of snapped me out of a fog I was living in and then made me realise that I needed to change my relationship with him and just sort of move on a little bit, you know, get, get myself going a bit more. And I, I think after you after you managed to extract yourself from that relationship, I think you found strength, didn't you? And I know you became a peer mentor. And from then... Yeah, that was the next sort of turning point. So in like December, World AIDS Day in 2016, Sheffield City Council asked if I'd do a speech for their, their day. And so I did that. And then in February 17, I did the peer mentor training course with Project 100 and Positively UK. And that was the first time I'd met anyone who had, you know, was open about their status, really. My partner was just living in this massive cloud of shame about it. I still hadn't managed to break up with him when I went on that course. It was very much an on and off, on and off. I told him to go away and he'd just come back and I'd just go, OK, then. <laughs> and just, you know, and it wasn't until after that where I really did put my foot down and finally managed to kick him out. Even though I'd known him for like six months, it was doomed. And I think for me, the, the well, what I noticed the change in you was the peer mentoring, I guess, gave as much to you as you gave to your clients, patients, I don't know what you call them, but your, the people that you were mentoring. And I think yeah. it's sharing of information, isn't it? And, and having a clan, belonging to people, you mm. know, being in the same boat, I guess, which is why not talking about things is so frustrating because we know that if you can talk about it and share the experiences, it helps mm. the sharer and the person who's listening. I think it was meeting other people of my age who had been through similar things. So because even though I went on the peer mentoring course, the other people on the course, they were all sort of in the 50s or 60s. And there was only two women and it was mostly men. And it was really nice to meet them, but I did sort of long to meet people my own sort of age. And the guy who ran the course, James, he was the same age as me and had been through some really similar circumstances. So I think that was really beneficial and really helpful. And when they asked me to then deliver the course, for me, that was really good because it was going around talking to people about living their best lives and self-esteem and how to be more confident and you know, confident when talking about HIV as well. It helped me. It was a, it was a like a, a syndrome process. You know, me talking about it made me more confident about it. You know, and it just went on like that. Yeah. Well, sometimes I think you have to act it before you believe it, don't you? So actually yeah, saying this yeah. is great. You know, let's then make you, it until you make it. <laughs> totally. Yes, you got that. I'm dreadful with my sayings, but yeah, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> really important that you. Uh, everybody who's diagnosed has somebody they can relate to that they can discuss you know their experience with and and you know talk to this person find out what you know what's next for them you know how they how they moved through their diagnosis what their journey was like I remember when I was first diagnosed I was uh, referred to a peer support group in Birmingham and everyone I spoke to was in their 60s and 70s mm-hmm. and you know and they'd they'd been horribly affected by sort of aging with HIV through the 80s and 90s and it terrified me because I'd just been diagnosed weeks before I'd been shown this group of guys in the 1670s who were disabled and who were grumpy and you know moaning about their council flats it's like this really isn't helpful it wasn't until I joined the online peer support of my HIV um, from THT Mm -hmm. that you know I started chatting to people my own age and that's you know Mm -hmm. that was kind of my turning point yeah it was nice um it wasn't until 2018 I remember September 2018 on one of the courses I delivered where I met a woman 
my age and a white woman who was born in this country and I was like oh it's so exciting and and it was really good because she already knew who I was <laughs> and I was like oh I feel like a celebrity now and then she said to me she was oh I was so happy when I found your blog just because it was another woman like me and yeah we really did connect over that so that again it really does make a difference just seeing yourself somewhere else and I met loads of people and it was great but I think it was something special about meeting someone who was very similar to me yeah and that, that's why I think it's so, so well first of all peer mentoring is so important but also the fact that people like you who can be open and honest because there are as we know you know other white heterosexual women living with HIV who mm. will never disclose because they don't see anybody else around them so <laughs> You know, I, I know you're so brave, and I've always said this, you're so mm-hmm. brave and inspirational to just go out there and go, oh, do you know what, sod it. You know, this is me, and, and not be ashamed of it. You know, mm-hmm. how, you know, just throw off those shackles and get rid of the mm-hmm. stigma, I suppose. And, and it is hard. It is really, really hard. So I know, you know, we've discussed a bit about this in, in clinic um, over the times, but tell me a bit about what it's like dating with HIV and going through the process of having to tell someone your status and I must say Becky was the person who um, pulled me up on the word disclosing because you know, <laughs> a lot of HIV doctors will say you know have you disclosed and you're right it's not a criminal um, that's it's using kind of a law term isn't it disclosure it's not about mm-hmm. disclosing something you don't have to it's about telling somebody so since then I have tried my best to oh, my thank you that's nice. tell us what it's like on the dating scene as a white heterosexual woman with HIV mm-hmm. when on earth do you tell people how do you go about it well when I was I was single for about three years and dating um and I went through a lot of different processes of of how and when to tell people and it's just suppose finding the one that you find the best and most comfortable so at first I was like oh I have to tell everyone immediately you know straight away and again with mixed responses and then I decided oh well I'll meet people before I tell them see whether it's interesting but I didn't really like that either it really helped that I had done a lot of this public stuff so what I started to do was after a few initial conversations because I dated online because there's no other way really for me to meet people at my age and um, being a single mum and stuff I could only really chat and date online I just find I would just copy and paste one of the interviews I did into the just like here's a link read it and come back to me if you've got any questions and that's generally how I you know approached it from then on or a lot of people would ask for my Instagram and my Instagram had all the, the stuff all over it. So I just say, OK, yeah, sure. Go look at my Instagram. And when you've got your questions, because I'm sure you will come back and ask me. I've had real mixed results from it. And I think it just it definitely just got easier each time I did it. Like the more you do it, the easier it becomes and the less the rejection hits you. Being rejected because of your HIV status is always rubbish. It, it always is. But it just becomes easier and everyone will say, oh, well, you didn't want them anyway. If they're going to act like that, you don't want to be with a person like that. And it's true, you don't, but that still doesn't mean it's really horrible when it happens, you know? And then, but you just learn to move on from it quicker. It used to take me days and and I'd still be thinking about it weeks later if somebody had rejected me. And, And then towards the end, it was just like, oh, well, just delete their number, delete their profile. And then I just move on, you know, it wouldn't really make any difference after a while. I think with online dating, it's very easy to dismiss people. So as soon as somebody has any characteristic that you don't like or you can't be bothered finding out about, you need to just say, oh, you know what, move on, don't care, just just move on from that. But what shocked me, I think, is the not the ignorance that people didn't know about it beforehand, because I still haven't met a single straight person who I've not told and given this as new information to. It was more the just refusal to learn, ref- absolute refusal to listen to the evidence. Mm. Was, so I remember one instance, I was chatting to somebody whose job role that said on Tinder was a PhD researcher. So I thought, so this is someone whose job, I don't know what they were researching now, I can't remember, mm. but do research. So I'd said about, he'd asked for my Instagram, I gave it him. And then they came back and said to me, well, I didn't know that. I thought that 
you couldn't not catch it. So if you had sex with someone who had HIV, you would definitely get it. And I said, no, that's not the case. And I said, all of my spiel about you equals you and all of that. And then he went, well, I just simply don't believe that. And so I was trying to stroke his ego a little bit and said, well, you seem like an intelligent man. When did you decide to stop learning things? Like, when did you decide to stop taking in new information? And, and then he was just like, well, I don't believe it. So, and that was it. And then he blocked me. So I was like, right, okay. So, you know, I don't think people will say, oh, people are uneducated, but it's got absolutely nothing to do with education level. Yeah, it's, it's just a willingness to learn, isn't it? Yeah, it's a willingness to know about it. So you touched on U equals U there, um, which is undetectable equals untransmittable for people who haven't heard that. Do you want to explain in your own words what um, U equals U means? Because I mean, <laughs> Naomi could explain it, but she's a doctor. No, no. <laughs> yeah. what you feel? I want to know what you say to these Tinder people. <laughs> Give us your spiel. So my, my, my paragraph that I used to copy and paste over, because I, I had it in my notes, so I just copied and pasted it over, was said that um, I'm HIV positive, um, I take medication which suppresses the virus in me, um, which means I become undetectable. And then I put in brackets, U equals U, Google it. I say that means that the virus in my body is suppressed and that I can't pass it on to sexual partners. Yeah. And that's just what I said. And then I usually copy and pasted a link of one of the articles that I had done which has links to like THT and National AIDS Trust and that, you know, for the statistics and yeah. like that to it. So I'd leave it to them to research because I'm not going to spoon feed people the information. I'll give them the information. And then if they want to go and research it further, then it's up to them. Uh, yeah. How did you feel um, the first time that uh, Naomi told you that you were undetectable? And did you know what it meant at the time? I remember the conversation with the nurse... Karen, I think it was, yeah. um, about being undetectable. Um, but I, to be honest, I, can, I didn't really think about it at the time because I became, became undetectable very quickly after my um, medication. I think it was on my, after like six weeks and they said you're undetectable and I was like, right. <laughs> it didn't mean anything to me because I was so unwell. I hadn't, and I was still with that partner. I hadn't even thought about what that would mean for my, health because I was like well I'm still I was still sick so I was like well it doesn't mean anything because I'm still ill um and I'm not having sex with anyone other than this one person so who had HIV as well so I didn't really think about it it wasn't until oh when was it I was going to say the peer mentoring course at early 2017 so I'd already been undetectable a year and a bit um for that but that was when they really talked about it and they talked about what it meant. And I think before then, because me and my partner had experimented sexually with other partners. Um, so I had had sex with other people, but I'd always felt guilty about around it. You know, I always had that sense of guilt that I shouldn't have done it. Um, even though I wasn't detectable and I wasn't, you know, putting anyone at risk. But I think that little bit of shame and guilt was still there that I was putting someone at risk even though I knew I couldn't pass it on and it wasn't until the peer mentoring course that actually it really stuck in okay no this is true this is fact and I remember going back to um the nurses that are there now in, in Rotherham and just saying why don't you tell patients about being undetectable and they're like oh our hands are tied by the NHS and we can't quite and I remember just Every time I went for an appointment, I was like, can you tell them yet? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and then it was later, was it that year or the next year? I think it became. Yeah, it was, it, it was only 2019 at Beaver, so British HIV Association made yeah. a statement and, you know, got on board with the U because you campaign. So yeah. before then we were, although there was lots of evidence out there. And I guess yeah. to, in perspective, I think for scientists or doctors or medics, we are evidence-based and the issue is is you're trying to prove a negative yeah. so it's very which is why you need vast numbers so obviously just just to kind of for people who are listening the partner studies were revolutionary really well there's there's been several studies but basically hundred well thousands and thousands of sex acts with um serodiscordant couples so one patient has hiv sorry, one partner has HIV, one partner doesn't. And there were no transmissions. But I guess as scientists, we're waiting for that one to disprove it. So I guess we were slightly behind the curve and you're right, you know, the Equals You campaign started in 2016, I think it was in America. Um, but for all the 
um, all the bodies, I guess, to get on board for then us to be, to feel safe and I guess covered and, you know, that we could then get on board with this campaign. It did take a long time. No, I understand what, you know, and I, I think I just wanted to be one of those pushy people to... Well, you were. <laughs> if you, if you, you've got to fight the fight, haven't you? You know, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm right. Well, that's what I thought anyway, because it's always like, why don't people yeah. know? People who I told about my status that I was dating who didn't reject me because of it, they were, the main thing they say is, is why, do, why don't we know? Why doesn't anyone know about Why hasn't this been in the news, you know, kind of thing? It's so frustrating that we haven't had a massive campaign like there was in the 1980s, mm. I guess, saying this um, and, you know, yeah. expressing this. And I know It's a Sin came on and we, I mean, we've already discussed this, me and Tom, but, you know, it was such a missed opportunity. They could have put something at the end, like yeah. a follow-up of... You know, but actually, this is what it's like nowadays. Yeah. And you know, I was, I was very disappointed there wasn't one of those black screens at the end, which yeah. simply said, "Now with medication, yeah, we'll live long, healthy lives." You know, or with the introduction of medication in two thousand and blah blah blah. Or you know, it would have been nice, just one of those, you yeah, know, screens. With okay, the I think if you're covering something as important as HIV and the AIDS epidemic, there's a certain responsibility of the show to to update people because it's something that hasn't gone away. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, I did love the show, but there was oh, yeah. flaws in terms of HIV specific stuff. You know, it's a very good show, though. But yeah, it was. But. Becky, can I ask your opinion? Because I get asked this a lot in clinic. Mm. When do I tell someone my status, especially now the U equals U that we know about? Yeah. When, when you're peer mentoring, I'm sure you get asked these questions as well. Do mm. you have any advice or is it just individual? I personally, I mean, I never advise people this because it is their, their own journey to get here. But I always say I personally always tell them before I meet them. Now, this is not because I feel like I have to tell them. I had plenty of just sexual encounters where I just wouldn't bother because there's no point. You know, mm -hmm. for them didn't even know my full name in these sexual encounters, let alone like I'm going to give them personal information about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I, I, it's not out of obligation it's more because it is a part of me for me it's a very public part of me and I will talk about it and they have to be okay with that they have to be okay with me bringing it up with their parents oh did you know by the way <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're right with this kind of thing because it's all over my social medias so yes. I always said for me I would chat to them for a while but before I chose to meet up with them, if it was going to be a dating situation yeah. and not just for sex, I would then tell them beforehand because I would rather not waste my time on someone who can't be bothered to look at scientific evidence. And yeah, and I guess uh, I think sometimes there's a, a, a perceived stigma, isn't there? That isn't always necessarily there, especially with education. But I think mm. it's the fear of the stigma, isn't it, that holds people back a lot? Yeah, I, I understand that I'm in a very privileged position as well. You know, I was free to tell my friends and family about my status. because I know that I wouldn't be rejected because of it. And I know that if I was rejected by one people, I have other friends that I am able to go to for support who yeah. would accept me because I had different groups of friends, not just one set of friends. Um, and I think if you know that your one set of friends has been stigmatizing in the past against people who are different, not just HIV positive, but who are, just don't fit into their mold of what's acceptable, mm. it'd be hard to tell them. I knew because I worked as a secondary school teacher, I knew when I told my employer, which I didn't have to, but I wanted to, because I was so sick, that I had the union behind me if mm -hmm. it came up, I knew that I was working for Sheffield City Council. So it was a big system mm -hmm. where I couldn't have been rejected or fired or had, you know, stigma, uh, you know, be stigmatized against because I had all of that system to support me. Um, so I realize I'm in a position of privilege because of that. And not everyone is in the same situation. That's why I can't advise people to tell everyone beforehand because I don't know their situation. And I guess we mustn't forget, you know, some people are in at risk of domestic violence and exactly, yeah. And so yeah, it's a very individual. Um, but the one thing I do always say is that it does get 
the more I tell, the easier it becomes. So and I think that is quite universal. Whether you choose to tell people before you meet them, whether you choose to tell them afterwards, the more you do it, the easier it does become. And I think it, the act of doing it is less scary than thinking about doing it. It is. I mean, at this point, you know, um, I've been diagnosed with 10 years this year. It's like telling somebody where you live now. It's like, hi, I, my name's Tom. I live in London. I've got HIV. It's like, it's just like for, for, for you as well, because you're so out publicly of your status. I mean, how did that even happen? How did you get into talking in the media about your HIV status? And how's that, that journey been for you? I just got contacted. So I made a anonymous Twitter profile called Poz Woman. Uh, <laughs> positive lad <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it was just to connect with people because unfortunately in Sheffield there wasn't any support there's in South Yorkshire there's no support services funded um so there was nowhere to go in my area for support so I looked online and I thought right well I'm gonna and after going to that positively UK course and then and so i uh, followed them on Twitter and then I went through on Twitter and saw all the people they were following and followed them um, and then I was just approached by um, THT and Sophia Forum when they did the Invisible No Longer campaign for women with HIV and it was through that 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 um, all the other stuff sort of came about really. In Sheffield there's a podcast called The Naked Podcast um, by the BBC it's quite popular and because they're Sheffield based um, and one of the uh, journalists who run it, she saw my Twitter and my blog because I followed some Sheffield stuff and, and she asked me to do that. And I think what got me in with the BBC. So now whenever in my area they've got anything to do with HIV, they tend to give you a call and ask you to, to say something on it. So, yeah, I'm just on their list now of contacts. It was a bit scary at first, like going so public about my status um, but it was more scary because my, I, after splitting up with my very toxic ex, he made it very clear that he thought what I was doing was disgusting and disgraceful and that having HIV sh is something to be ashamed of. So that why am I going out talking about it? I'd say the only thing that worried me about being public about it was him finding out that I'd done it. And lo and behold, he did about a year or two late, it was a year, 2019, he, he discovered it, and I had a nice barrage of insulting text messages and voicemails. So that was like a delight. Oh yeah, well, luckily by that time I was uh, very confident in myself and able to just because he was already blocked. My stupid phone sends you a message saying somebody sent you a message from a blocked number. Do you want to see it? And I'm like, well, I don't have the willpower to say no. no. To <laughs> so so unfortunately, they all came through and. But it was fine, like I was in a better place to deal with it. I literally could just ignore it and delete them and not really ever think about it. Do you want to tell us about your work? You So you work for uh, BHA Lead Skyline. So yep. tell us about, about them and what you do. So my role is service user engagement lead, which is mainly to make sure that the services we're offering are what people want, what they need. Um, we are a support and prevention service. We're one of the few I think there's only one or two left in the country that is is funded by the council um, so we've got a really good system up there we have support workers who help those who are really quite needy we've got our peer mentor service we have our prevention team who are funded to work in black African communities so but we support anyone living with HIV um, so and then I do deliver a lot of training to other services and council and sometimes schools and universities things like that um yeah and I, that's it pretty much and I just work to do to raise the profile of our service and of people living with HIV in general thank you so much for all your hard work <laughs> good to know there's good people behind it mm -hmm. so one last question I suppose um what would you tell um yourself um, who's just been diagnosed now, if you could go back in time. You know, what advice would you give uh, Becky, who's just been diagnosed? Don't stay with someone just because they gave you HIV. <laughs> no, I think it goes for, I mean, uh, this is just through my own reflections and analysis of my own behaviour and seeing it reflected in almost all the women I've met who 
accept really rubbish situations in their life because they have HIV. Yeah. Toxic family relationships, toxic relationships with men or women, whoever it might be, they accept all of it because they have this underlying shame that they have HIV. So therefore they should be lucky for what they get. Yeah. Just to say that it doesn't make you any less desirable. Yeah. Sorry, I completely agree. I see so many women who sit there in these sort of horrid relationships and it doesn't make you any less of a beautiful human being or woman or, you know, your desires, your needs, yeah. everything else is exactly the same. And I think it's, you know, you've proven you just need the strength to, yeah. to tell people to, we're not allowed to swear, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Not off. Yeah. And I feel like as well, have the therapy, the offer. I mean, I don't know if it's across the country, but I know where I was, the offer, everyone who's diagnosed therapy, take the therapy. Because yeah. I think for everyone needs a bit of therapy, whether you've had a diagnosis or not. I, agree. <laughs> you know, um, I think it's great and it can be really life affirming as well to go through. And just remember the things like what you're actually looking for. Find out what you want you know, unrelated to your HIV. I value myself as a person now, whereas before I had my diagnosis, I didn't. And it's one of those situations that I'd love to look into further as to how, whether women who contract HIV, their state of mind as to how, how it connects and how it works with taking what might be seen as, I didn't see it as risky behavior, having sex with someone without a condom. Um, and I don't think most people would, but then I don't think most people like women in my situation have really all the facts because mm. yeah, it's not targeted at them. Yeah. I didn't think about catching an STI because I thought I'm a woman in my thirties and with a kid, where am I going to, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not on me. That's not that kind of thing. That's what happens to teenagers, yeah. young people, you know? Yeah. Well, negotiating condoms can be very difficult um, and you know it takes mm. confidence it takes communication mm. um, and obviously I guess that brings us all around to um, I guess the whole emphasis of saving lives is you know get tested um, yeah. make sure you're looking after yourself you know yeah. use condoms I know sometimes it's not always negotiable and it's not always doesn't always happen but if you haven't used a condom you know get tested again and yeah. you know, I think it's about having enough respect for your own body and um, I think I think a lot of women, not everyone, but a lot of women find it hard to navigate those conversations about sex because yeah. as a society, as women, we're taught to be grateful for yeah. the attention. We're taught, oh, this person's giving you attention, therefore you should be happy about that. Yeah. I want to have sex with you, so you should be happy about that. Yeah. They don't want to use a condom. You're going to upset the man if you tell him to use a condom. So you have to agree with what the man does. I saw I saw a, lo a lovely post on Instagram about um, someone making some cartoon about some it was a heterosexual relationship and him saying but I can't orgasm if I use a condom and she was like <laughs> welcome oh, to my oh, world, my world. <laughs> Prob I probably won't be orgasming either with you <laughs> yeah we'll navigate this together <laughs> I think we all need to be yeah a bit more bolshy a bit more confident but again that comes with time and wisdom doesn't it and, and knowledge and, and education yeah. and learning what you want out of a sexual encounter as well a lot of heterosexual sex is focused on penis and vagina stuff yeah. that's, that's pretty much the pinnacle of sex where actually there's a m many wonderful things you can do without that yeah. and it's not the be all and end all and I think a lot of women and men uh, who are in heterosexual relationships you know need to to recognize that a lot more sex doesn't always finish when the man comes you yeah. know why does it have to finish when the man comes just because what well, because he can't be bothered anymore like he you know, wants to fall asleep but, <laughs> why why does sex finish then <laughs> like, i don't i don't understand it i've never really understood it why is that when it finishes you know that's not how it finishes you know in in non-heterosexual relationships not all the time anyway so yeah I just think it needs to be addressed more in in general sex education and sex positivity these are all very common themes that are coming out of <laughs> yeah. yes is you know talking 
you know, confidence, um, you know, redefining what sex is. And so, yeah, it's, it's great. Really good. Thank you so much for joining us today, Becky. Uh, where can people find you and follow you online? Uh, so my Twitter is poswoman, pos underscore woman 87. Um, and my Instagram is rebex underscore 101. So people can follow me on there. I've also do most of the social media for my work, VHA Leeds Skyline. So if you're living in the North, affected by HIV, um, our peer mentoring programme doesn't isn't limited to those that live in Leeds. You know, we can outstretch to, you know, North Yorkshire as well. So um, if you want to get in touch with me or through VHA Leeds Skyline. Awesome. We'll put all the links to those down in the description. Well, thank you for joining us, Becky. Thank you. Have a great thank week. You. Bye. 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 So that's today's show. Thank you for listening to Sex Unwrapped, a podcast by Saving Lives UK. Please remember to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts. Saving Lives is a UK charity committed to improving the sexual health of the nation. To find out more about Saving Lives UK and to find out where you can get a sexual health or HIV test, head to savinglivesuk.com. <laughs> <laughs>